On today's episode of With the First Pick, we'll tell you which 11 players have the most to gain from a great week at the Senior Bowl, which, of course, starts next Tuesday, Mobile, Alabama. And that's right. We'll be there from start to finish. Conversation, as always, starts with the quarterbacks. And there is a stack group headed down to the Senior Bowl. But we'll tell you the other names and the other positions you need to know on the first leg of our unofficial With the First Pick pre-draft tour. I'm Ryan Wilson. That's Rick Spielman. This is episode 115. Rick, how many days until the 2024 NFL draft? Yeah, I lost count the last time. It was like 100 and some. And all of a sudden, it's down to like 91 days until the 2024 NFL draft. 91 days. You mentioned uh, you, you've been sporadically on the podcast because of some side jobs you got going on. So why don't you give us the latest uh, for folks who maybe missed the the disclaimer you gave last week and you're on the show about what you're up to and when you're going to be back full time with with the first pick. <laughs> I am back full time with the first pick as long as they're willing to have me. Uh, just assisting the owner and Adam Peters, Peters in the commander's head coaching search. But after that, and anything that I say on this podcast or anything going forward has no influence or anything what the Washington commanders are going to do. These are my own personal opinions, my own evaluations that have nothing to do with the Washington commanders. Is it true that uh, Josh Harris said explicitly, I do not want your evaluation because I've listened to the podcast and it's very troubling? Yeah. He actually uh, liked the podcast. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's great. All right. There you go. Do you say anything about the handsome co-host? No, not at all. Nothing. All right. All right. Not, not with your, like, that velvet orange. Oh, yeah. You hate this. You can. I hate that. This is like the second time you wore it. I can't remember which episode you wore, it, but it's just brutal to my, uh, uh, look at for the next hour. It's my homage to Kyle McCord coming to save the cues, baby. Yeah, it, looks, uh, it looks like your pajamas. <laughs> my pajamas. Debo, he is back. Nothing has changed. It's like when your kid goes off to college and you're happy to see him for the first two hours in the drive home. And then you're like, all right. <laughs> when does school start? I take this guy back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Let's talk about this senior bowl preview here because uh, it's up. It's upon us. I remember where this board behind me had 200 plus days on it. And we're under 100. Rick, as promised, is going to be uh, completely brutal and honest with his evaluations of my evaluation. So uh, let's start with uh, we came up with 11 players, 11 star, because I, I added a quarterback. Uh, we're talking about some players that aren't quarterbacks. So it's been a lot of the fall yeah, talking that's, quarterback. That's, that's, that's the one thing I wanted to bring up, because, you know, what I am a stickler on the rules and a stickler on the oh, instructions. And go. our boss, Debo, specifically said five players that could potentially help their draft stock at the senior bowl. So I did my five. I had a couple of decisions to make. Mm -hmm. I cut two or three out yet. You go beyond the rules and just add another guy, which I don't understand why he gets to do that Debo. And I don't. There you go. There's your answer. It's called kissing <laughs> up to the teacher. That's why I, I do extra credit whenever you get the chance. You know what happened, like Rick? Said, Give me the rules. Just let me know what the rules I'm playing with, and I'll play within the rules. I'll tell you exactly what happened. So I'm going through all the players to make sure I've seen them before we get there, and there are a lot of guys that I like and want to talk about, and then I said, well, we can't not have quarterbacks on the list. So that's how we got to the to the quarterback. And teaser, it's not my favorite quarterback that Rick's dislike. It's a quarterback that I think we're uh, going to be talking a lot about the next 91 days or so. All right, let's start here. Why does the Senior Bowl matter? Because I think sometimes, and this is funny, our buddy Pete Prisco, who we work with, gives us a hard time when we go on the pro day tours. He's like, "Ah, hey, you don't need to see those guys or the, uh, the, yeah, the pro day tours. You don't need to see those guys in person. What are you doing? And then just the other day, he said on HQ, you know what? When I saw Jordan Love this summer at camp, I got a sense of who he was. I got to see him throw in person, and that changed my opinion of who Jordan Love is. You can say the same thing about Jordan Love at the Senior Bowl. And some other guys as well. But why is the Senior Bowl important for you when you were GMing it up in Minnesota? Yeah, well, a couple of things. One, if I didn't get to see them during the season live, it gives you an opportunity to get these uh, players uh, on the field. You get It's the last time that these guys will be in pads for your final evaluation. Then the rest of the way through is going to be everything done in shorts at the Combine and at the Pro Day. So this is the last chance to see these guys against the best of the best. I think and I think Jim Nagy does a phenomenal job putting these rosters together. Uh, the other thing is that at the Senior Bowl, 
it's the first time you really get to sit down and start having one-on-one -on -one interviews with all these players. So it's the start of the draft process. There's a lot of psychological testing going on. I know they take tests there. One of the tests for sure that's done there is the HRT test, uh, which we used to use. So this is actually, in my opinion, after the national championship game, the start of the pre-draft process. And that's at the East-West game who they do a phenomenal job, the, the Senior Bowl, who they do a phenomenal job. But it's the first time, the last time you get to see them in competitive periods with pads on, but also the first time you get an opportunity to start interviewing and trying to find out who these players actually are. So this is my sixth year covering the draft for CBS. I was adding it up yesterday. Debo asked me a couple of days ago for some names of players during my time who have really helped themselves in the? You know how many senior bowls I'm at? Four. <laughs> <laughs> I, wait, have you? So thirty plus years. All those years, did you go to the senior bowl? Every year, I've never missed the senior bowl. As a Blesto guy, did you go to the senior bowl? I went to the senior oh, bowl as a Blesto guy. So you're thirty, thirty plus. Thirty plus years at the senior bowl. Holy Moses! Oh uh, wow! I actually like Mobile, Alabama. It reminds me of uh, Syracuse of the South in terms of the size of the city. So looking forward to it. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. I actually really do like Mobile, Alabama. Um, all right. So before I get to the names that I gave Debo, let me ask you this. Have you ever gone into a senior bowl interview or any sort of pre-draft interview, really loving a player's tape and then just talking to the player going like, this isn't going to work? Yeah. No, there's times where you get to do that. And the one thing that's important about the interview process and Jim Nagy and his senior bowl have done a phenomenal job on organizing it now that the players rotate from team pod to team pod. So everybody gets an equal amount of time with these players. I remember back in the day, you're just waiting for them to come through the lobby. You're trying to grab players. You have the runners down there. When I was a blessed scout, I was a runner trying to, oh, here comes Bobby Bag of Donuts from Wichita <laughs> State. Uh, we need to uh, Great player. Get yeah, so I'd be sitting there. Some other team would grab them. Then I'd wait till that team was done. Then I would hustle them off to our people who needed to evaluate them. So it was a mess. But just like the combine got organized, I think Jim Nagy has done a phenomenal job giving each team equal amount of time to get in front of these uh, players, which is a critical part of the evaluation process. I don't think I'm telling stories out of school, but you were the you were the muscle at the combine, right? For corralling players. Yes, that's my longest weight where I squatted on a player was uh, who was it? Douglas, who came out of Central Hugh? Ohio, Hugh Douglas. Yeah, and he was in the Washington Redskins at the time in that room for over two and a half hours. Oh my gosh, what are we doing? It, and and because he they were doing all their psychological testing in there, all these other things. And I'm, I just I sat there. I was like, I can't. Well, they didn't have Apple watches back then or yeah. phones. You know, we just, you just sat there and waited. And then at the uh, the old way of the combine used to do it, not to get in any combine stories, is that we were in the train station and they would go in the front door and they were supposed to come out the front door. Well, there was a back door. Uh, also at the in these rooms. And so there were teams cutting side deals on sneaking a player out the back door. So while you're sitting in the front door, you and five other guys trying to fight to get the player to come to your room, there was deals going on on the back. And it oh, was, please. yeah, it was a very competitive environment on trying to get the players to get to your room. That would never, ever, ever, ever fly in today's NFL because of social media and because every, everyone would oh, be getting fired. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was the wild, wild west. I'll just say that. Well, that's why you got Rick to be the muscle. I love it. <laughs> yep, just a guy just trying to make a living. All right. We're doing a pretty good job of that. How about some of these guys? I'll throw some names out at you, and you tell me um, if you think they helped their draft stock. This is just the last few years, guys that are – uh, two of the guys, just uh, one guy just played in the playoffs. He just got knocked out. Another guy's still playing, and uh, two other franchise-type players. Let's start with Debo Samuel. That was my first senior bowl. I remember talking to him after one of the practices on Tuesday or Wednesday. And the issue with Debo, he had injury history uh, coming out of South Carolina. But the other issue was how fast is he? And I remember talking to him after one practice saying, you know, what about the issue with your speed? He said, well, I was, I was pretty fast today. I, I think I'm 
answering a lot of questions. Ended up being a second round pick. And he is integral to what, what San Francisco does because when he's not in there, that offense with all those playmakers is not quite the same. Did you you remember before and after thoughts about Debo pre draft? Yeah, I think it was. <coughs> excuse me, how's he fit? Because he was such a phenomenal athlete, but was he a good route runner? Was he a traditional just receiver? But he was such a freak athlete and can do so many things. I think that's when teams really started to evaluate these unique athletes. I know we went through the same thing, although I can't remember. I don't believe Cordero Patterson was there. Uh, but how can you utilize these guys in the offense that are unique athletes, but they don't have to be like a traditional receiver? Yeah. And Cordell was obviously a first-round pick. He was a better, quote-unquote, athlete testing-wise, I would imagine, probably healthier than Debo was, and maybe those are some of the knocks against Debo. But, I mean, Debo's a first-round pick all day long if we're doing the redraft here. Uh, Rick, another, do you know who uh, who Debo's lined up against in this photo? So that's Texas. Oh, uh, I know the corner. Uh, did we was he with us? Oh, that's Chris you, Boyd. You drafted him, Chris Boyd. Is that Chris Boyd? Yep. Oh, I got that. Look at that. I got it for you. Got it, Rick. He's yeah. a tough player, man. He's still playing. He's still in the league. Yep. Yeah. Yep. He uh, very good special team player. Yeah. Third, corner give you depth, but boy, was he a tone setter on special teams. Yeah. That's I remember the edge with which he played. Nice. Look at Debo. All right. Next up, also in this draft class, if I recall correctly, and this young man came down. Well, it, we found out later, I think, at the combine when he ran a 4-4 or whatever it was. But even at the senior bowl in the one-on-one -on -one drills, which is it favors the the defense, let's be honest, but whatever. It was still fun to watch. He was destroying guys, Montez Sweat. And he yeah. parlayed that into being he would have been a, I think a top 15 pick there was some medical stuff that came out late in the draft process he's been great uh first with Washington and this year with Chicago when he was traded I don't know if you heard the stat Rick or maybe we talked about it here he led both Washington and Chicago in sacks this year <laughs> that's how no, good he was crazy yeah I don't know if I've <laughs> ever been around a player that was traded and then got there uh for the remainder of the season and then left their new team in sacks tells yeah. you how good the pass was rush was before he got there exactly do you remember evaluating him? Because he, athletically, he's off the charts, and then he just sort of took it to another level post uh, postseason pre-draft. Yeah, and I, I think the thing that really helps talent evaluators is, and back then it was the full coaching staff, so it was the teams and their entire coaching staff that were coaching these guys. Uh, and now, which I think is great, is a mixture of young guys that are getting an opportunity to develop like the head coaches and the uh, maybe position coaches become coordinators. And I think that helps from the development of a coaching side. But I always love the one on one situations, uh, especially in pass rush, because their defense is usually going to have a little bit of an advantage. But what you watch is what they learned in college and then what the NFL coaches are actually teaching them. And we talked about it last year when we were down there. How much better did those guys get from Monday to Thursday just by working on the technique and how much more comfortable they got and how much better they got through the week? Because especially some of these kids from a smaller school, and we talked about the kid from Bowling Green, Brooks, when they moved him inside last year. Yeah. Okay, that was foreign to him because he didn't do it very much at Bowling Green. But all of a sudden, you see him from Monday to Thursday, and you see him keep climbing. So I think when you get guys with this unique athletic ability, and Montez, I do believe you're correct, was more the medical side of it. But the physical traits definitely jumped out, especially in the one-on-one -on -one drills down there. Yeah, Zion Johnson out of Boston College, played left tackle his final year in college. He worked solely inside guard and center at the Senior Bowl and parlayed that into being a first-round pick. We'll see that again from Graham Barton out of Duke. Uh, this year when we get down to the senior bowl. So I would imagine Zion and, and Graham have been preparing for that move inside. But I I remember when Scott Pioli was at the senior bowl with us a few years ago, and he was talking to one of the players that he knew uh, for one of his side jobs. You may know something about that, Rick. But the, the player was frustrated because he was being asked to do things he had never done in college, and he felt like he wasn't showcasing his best self. Is that a concern? No, you know what I think it is? I think it is they get concerned because they may not, it may be awkward or foreign to them. So then they're not right. going to look as good. And I think that's going to affect their draft stock. And sometimes it's the exact opposite. Uh, 
learning something new and seeing how quickly they can adapt to a new technique. Now, schematically, it's pretty simple. They try to keep it as simple on offense and as simple on defense as possible. I think you can play man coverage and, and a zone coverage, and that's it because they want the guys to play fast. They won't, They don't want them to have to think about, oh, my God, it's check here, this and that. Yep. This is more very basic offense and defensive schemes. Let us teach you some new techniques. Let's see how quickly you adapt to those techniques, and let's see how fast you can play. All right, two other names also uh, at the Senior Bowl at the same time, the 2020 draft class. Both had questions coming in because both didn't play lights out their final year in college. Uh, Justin Herbert, who came in and, was absolutely slinging it. Um, you know, he's 6'5 all day long, maybe taller than that. And the ball just explodes out of his hand when you see it in person, which is something you talk about all the time. And Jordan Love was also there. And he had a not great season at Utah State. And primarily because I think he tried to do too much. They lost their offensive line. They lost a, a lot of wide receivers, a new coaching staff, I believe. Um, but again, there's a guy who got to sit a couple of years and turns out he's pretty good. Also a fantastic athlete, fantastic arm strength. I think Justin Herbert has a better arm but the ball gets on you in a hurry. Uh, I, I don't know. know. Oh, uh, <laughs> all right. Tell me about those two guys. Herbert has a great arm. I'm not saying that, but don't discount the arm. That no, I think he has that. a cannon. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. I think if you're having a fastball throwing contest, it's close. Yeah, no, I, yeah, but don't, this kid can throw the ball now, and he showed that down at the senior bowl and how easy the ball comes off his hand as well. And, you know, the tight spiral and, you know, maybe the timing's off a little bit with the receivers first time they're working with him. But I remember because I had, I didn't get an opportunity to see Justin Herbert, what he looked like in person. I did because I went to the Frisco Bowl. I'll never forget this on a rainy night when Utah State played Kent State in that bowl game and what a presence that Jordan Love had in that game. So that's why... It's such a difference when you can see these guys live. And when he get when like Justin Herbert, I had a different opinion because all of a sudden I seen his stature, how big he is. I was like, whoa, I didn't think this guy was this big. And you can see how the ball comes off his hand, uh, where you can't really tell that on tape. You can see it. it looks like it has velocity, but a lot of the stuff that you can't see on tape. And if you didn't see him in a season because you didn't have an opportunity to get to that school. Uh, this it really checks the boxes down there at the senior bowl. And I was actually telling Debo when we were talking about this, <clears throat> Jalen Hurts was in that same senior bowl QB class, and he sort of flew under the radar that week because everyone was focused on Jordan, everyone was focused focused on Justin Herbert. But you said during the pre-draft process you enjoyed talking to Jalen Hurts perhaps more than anybody. I don't yeah. know if he hurt himself that week. But it just seemed like he wasn't flashing at the level that others expected. No, but all of a sudden everybody got to know what type of person he is because of the interview. And, okay, this kid's pretty special when you sit down there and talk with him. And then that's when you go back uh, and talk about, hey, because we would have all the draft reports done, and then we'd have an additional senior report or East-West game report added into that. Then we added the combine report. So you kept building the draft profile for each player uh, as you went through each step all the way up to the draft. Hey, right, uh, talk... speaking oh, okay, ahead, of, of that 2020 quarterback class, if, if you remember last week in our rankings, I <laughs> uh, had a lot of success on, on social media. I wouldn't say it was our most beloved rankings ever. You guys, as a reminder, ranked Jordan Love as a consensus number one as the quarterback you'd have for the next five years out of that 2020 class over Tua, Jalen Hurts, Justin Herbert, and Joe Burrow. Uh, it's It's hard for me to find comments that I can show on screen that are, are <laughs> YouTube friendly. Um, but here are a few. Uh, a couple from Michael on YouTube writes, uh, Jordan Love over Joe Burrow is ridiculous. Actually, like he might have long-term memory loss problems. Fair. <laughs> the Joker writes, Burrow, Herbert, Hurts, Love, Tua was their ranking. Look, the thing with Burrow, and I think we both said this, you had Burrow two, I had him three, which is, it is certifiably crazy. The injuries, if he's healthy, he's number one all day that's long. What the, that's what the exercise was. So yeah. if people would listen to the full rules, no one wants to listen to the rules that we're dealing with. We had to take in, Burrow has what, had been healthy for one year. Yeah. Um, now you led then, to the Super Bowl, but fair enough. <laughs> yeah, but he's, but yeah, when he's healthy, yeah. I, uh, W uh, with uh, everybody out there. But please understand that they have to be on the field too. And don't yeah. tell me that Jordan Love 
made tremendous strides from the first half of the season to the second half of the season. And the way, you know, except for the bonehead interception thrown across his body against Dallas, that I, I thought Green Bay had a or uh who was it? not Dallas, who they San uh, Fran. San Fran. They had a little legitimate chance to win that game. They should have won that game all day long. If Darnell Savage catches the ball that hits him in the face, maybe that takes care of it early in the game. But yeah, and I do wonder if I mean you're looking for a nuanced conversation on the internet. That's that's on you, Rick. But I mean I just I don't <laughs> it is insane. It is you could question why Jordan Love would be number one on that list. Part of it is Joe Burrow. Debo's instructions were the next five years. Justin Herbert has not lived up to expectations. He's a fantastic quarterback, and I would imagine things are changing with John uh, Jim Harbaugh arriving. But Jordan Love has played the best football of that crew over the last two months. Yeah, so you're betting on the come. So, you know, and if Jordan Love has another tremendous year next year, if Herbert, and he struggles to stay healthy as well, and he takes a beating now, maybe with Jim Harbaugh, Debo, can we ask, like, can we redo this in a year from now? If these other two guys stay healthy. I'll make a note. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's making a note, Rick. I think he's uh, making a note so we can stir up the uh, social media thing. Thank God. Yeah, I, I have think this time next year, Jalen Hurts is going to be number one with um, Ger- Gerard Johnson or Eric Bieniemy as his offensive coordinator. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll circle back. And uh, maybe after the Senior Bowl, Rick, we'll get back in the dollar betting game. We haven't done a lot of that, and I got to make back my nine dollars or seventeen dollars that I lost last year. Well, uh, yeah, you're not, but go ahead. You can try. All right. I usually I just, can throw I, some this year if you need me to. Okay, we'll see. All right, let's talk about some of the players that uh, helped themselves at the Senior Bowl. While Rick Spielman was a general manager, slash in the front office in Minnesota, of course, Harrison Smith is the one of the biggest names, perhaps the biggest name. And if you if you want to check it out. I'll make Debo put a link in the description. That's what the kids say on YouTube, Debo. Of uh, Rick explaining how Harrison Smith made his way to Minnesota. It was uh, top secret. Did you guys talk to him at the Senior Bowl at all? I don't remember. He was in the damn... Yes, we did. <laughs> but after that, you didn't talk to him, correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. Did we not uh, coach him that year, Debo? Now Debo's scrambling. You yeah, coached yeah. Him? You, you coached him that year. Uh, right. So Kirk Cousins was on your roster. Russell Wilson was on your roster. Yeah. Uh, no. Harrison Smith. Oh, okay. We, yeah. So um, we did talk to him, Brian. You know, <laughs> how mad was like, he, Debo? He's like, he was on the damn team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he just walked by in the lunch uh, lunch line and in the meetings. Every, but I every remember your story. Ignored him. My God. I remember yeah, your story. Have that, communications with him, uh, but afterwards, he, what happened? Then we didn't talk to him again, right? Intentionally, because you didn't want to give off any signals. Correct. Uh, you don't have to answer this if you want to. If it gets you in trouble, but it's part of the concern because everybody talks. Like teams talk, agents talk. Are you concerned that you just want agents saying to other teams, "Hey, so and so's poking around," just so you know to improve their draft stock oh, or whatever? All, we we had all of our. Um, Assistants, uh, scouting assistants that track everything on social media and track everything on visits where teams are, you know, who had private workouts with teams who had visits. Then that was part of the process along gotcha. with it, identifying the team needs on when you're in the draft. And we got player A and B there. Do we trade back? Well, if you trade back, the, the team two picks behind you have had a top 30 visit. They had a private workout with this player. So we were satisfied with everything we needed to know, especially when we got an opportunity to coach him for a week. What else can you can you possibly want to do with the kid? Yeah. Did you regret not talking to him all week at the Senior Bowl? Yeah, no. That's. I think we should have took advantage of that opportunity. And you're right, Ryan. We didn't <laughs> talk to him. And uh... you know, it's funny uh, now that we live in, in the social. You know, in social... I'm, in the, I'm under the hundred day thing now, right? Oh yeah, you can go crazy. <laughs> but one of the. Um, things that that show up every spring uh there's a person on the internet i'm not sure who does it that tracks the 30 visits and one of the things they've discovered over the last three or four or five years is that a lot of the 30 visits because 30 visits happen for a lot of reasons we'll talk about that as we get through the process but a lot of the 30 visits that make their way to dallas end up getting drafted so that that's a key indicator and perhaps you guys uncovered that as you were doing your prep work too but i thought that was pretty interesting because sometimes you bring in 30 visits for different reasons but um we'll get to that a few weeks months down the road Next up, Kellen Mond. 
yes. a favorite of mine and a favorite of Pete Prisco's for different reasons. He likes to give you a hard time for that. I yeah. like Kellen Mond coming out. The knock on Kellen Mond when I talked to some scouts was that he played too robotically. Correct. And then the one thing is that at the Senior Bowl, he wasn't as robotic. He looked uh, great at the Senior Bowl. <laughs> yeah. Uh, made a couple really off-schedule type throws. I think that was the year in the third round where it was uh, Trask, Mond, and uh, Mills all bunched together that went one, two, and three. Yep. So um, we just uh, we felt that at the Senior Bowl, and again, this is where the coaches come into play too. Um, on they, they had an opportunity to sit and talk with them. We did a lot of we went down, did workouts with them, and everything. And but that was a knock on him. Was he too robotic? And then you you know what he showed down at the Senior Bowl. You're hoping that he was able to let loose a little bit and not think as much. Uh, like he did when he was just down at the senior bowls, just slinging the ball around. And, you know, he's, he's been bouncing around the league since then. Uh, I know Minnesota cut him and then it was with Cleveland on their practice squad, been inconsistent during the um, preseasons and then ended up on Indy's practice squad uh, for after uh, Anthony Richardson went down. Again, it just reconfirms like people can see different things in a player and it's just so incredibly difficult to try to figure out. I remember that Alabama game. He was absolutely slinging it. LSU game. It didn't play quite so great. And he's, a, he's one of those guys that played a lot of football in college as well. So sometimes that weighs in your favor. Sometimes it doesn't. You live and you learn Rick. All right. Yeah. Brian O'Neill, former tight end, moved to offensive tackle, second round pick that you made out of pit. He was also at the senior bowl. Yeah, no, he was, tight end that moved to left tackle, played right tackle, and Pitt, he went on both sides. Uh, we had injury, and then during his rookie year, he stepped in at right tackle and has been there ever since, but had a really good senior bowl, verified a lot of the things um, that we saw on tape. So that was one that uh, checked the boxes through our whole process and and uh, and actually was a, a, a good pick for us. Can I ask you this? Because I don't, that, that's the year before I started covering the draft closely. Do you know why he fell to the bottom of the second round? With the, with the I think the concern a little bit was his stature because he wasn't overly big. Okay. I mean, he was a lean, wiry guy, needed to add some bulk and strength, which as he physically matured, he has. But I think that was the biggest thing. And there was no question about the athleticism, especially since he was a converted tight end. Right. But was his girth and his, size and his bulk big enough to to line up and be a starter but no there's no one more competitive I, I don't believe anyone as tough as he is or as smart as he is and he overcame that six seven three ten that's that's a wiry for <laughs> for for an offensive lineman but um and that's something that we talk about with Blake, Blake Freeland for example when he was coming out of BYU last year all right we'll get to one more name here one of your guys. This guy ran a sub four five uh, forty. I remember that off the top of my head. Also converted tight end, I believe. Garrett Bradbury, NC State, played center. Uh, great athlete. Never played as consistently, at least early on in his career in the NFL, that perhaps you were hoping. Yeah, no, I think, uh, and he's gotten better. Uh, yeah. been a, he's been a very good run blocker. Uh, he fit the scheme at the time when we drafted him. What Gary Kubiak wanted is is that outside zone scheme so he wanted undersized guys that can move and run his biggest issue was that can he hold up and struggled some versus the bull rush and pass protection and when a big nose gets on top of him but from a schematic standpoint he checked all the boxes the smarts the intelligence uh the athletic ability to move laterally but if you're going to ask him to do some things in a gap scheme with a big nose over that's where he struggled but you can see he's he's really um, – and he had a, a wrestling background too, which was right. especially offensive and defensive linemen. Uh, that was a bonus for us. But he's he's improved uh, from where he was. But, um, you know, I think he's still a solid starter in the league. Um, you know, so we'll see where the rest of that goes. As I'm watching these uh, Senior Bowl guys is ahead of the Senior Bowl here, and you talk about – putting Navita Vea over a 295 pound center and he's going to struggle for the most part. How do you, as an offensive line coach or an OC, how do you combat that? Well, that's how, what your scheme is. Are you doing scoop blocks? Are you doing combination blocks? 
Are you trying to get them to move laterally instead of just, you know, trying to run into a brick wall? Yeah. So those are all the things when you're marrying up your personnel evaluation with a schematic look, um, then you listen to the coaches. Well, this is what he can do. And this is how we envision him being successful with these lateral movements. It was cut blocking, which you can't cut block anymore in line like you used to in the past. A lot yeah. of things that, uh, you know, that they had a lot of success with. Uh, Rick Dennison, who was the offensive line coach, run game quarter, what they did a lot of with those undersized guys out in Denver. Yeah. Cause I see a lot of, um, not a lot, but you see occasionally these undersized centers struggling with guys like Tavondre Sweat, for example, or even Byron Byron Young. Uh, what's Byron's last name? Is it Byron Young? Byron Young II? Yeah. Okay. I always want to call him um, Bryce Young. Okay. The two the two guys at, at uh, Texas, one is about 40 pounds heavier than the other. They're both insanely athletic and um, have given it to some, some interior offensive linemen that will see the senior bowl. All right. Before we move on quickly. And uh, Debo's touched on it. Kirk Cousins was on that roster with Harrison Smith. Yeah, um, it was interesting. We coached that game. It was Leslie's, I believe, second year as a head coach. We had just drafted Ponder. Um, and oh, yeah. so we had Joe Webb on the roster as well, uh, who we've talked about <laughs> numerous times. Love Joe I Webb. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> but, but something's going to happen out there. And then uh, in 12, we thought we, had too, we were too young, you know, um, we had McNabb in 2011, uh, and that was the uh, holdout, the lockout year. So they didn't get into yeah. maybe in August before we uh, started training camp at the time. And then McNabb kind of struggled with us, and Ponder kind of finished out the year uh, because we were three and thirteen. And then in 2012, we ended up going ten and six, making it to the playoffs with Ponder. And Ponder was at the Senior Bowl too. Um, but Kirk and and Russell were another young guys very talented guys they both went i believe that russ go in the third round or fourth round and so did uh cousins i think went in the russ fourth. went third i think kirk went four yeah so um kirk was the pocket passer um russ was a little bit more athletic both of them had good senior bowls uh but we we liked them but we weren't going to draft another quarterback because we had a lot of those young kids now you Hindsight, you wish you maybe would have drafted them. You know, we drafted them both. <laughs> yeah, well, we ended up signing Kirk Cousins, so yeah. uh, we did get Kirk there. Um, but it was, I think, that year in 2012, we went 10 and six. Ponder actually played very well, uh, beat Green Bay uh, at home to get us into the playoffs. Uh, Ponder had a great game against Green Bay, then got hurt, couldn't play in that first playoff game. Joe Webb started. We went down the field and scored. I'll never forget it in Green Bay. And then uh, Green Bay just was they, – they had a good football team, and I believe it was Rodgers or Favre at the time took over after that. So uh, – 20 – what year was that? 2012. That was uh, Bill Musgrave. That was his first year as our offensive coordinator. Uh, Leslie had brought him in as the offensive coordinator. So, um, and I remember Russell Wilson walking in, he was, you know, we had a team meeting that night and, um, he came in and he came in in a sport coat and, you know, he was all business. Uh, both of them, you know, Kirk was Kirk <laughs> He is taking notes, uh, into it as, 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 as hard as anyone could ever get into something Two, you know, really, really great kids, but there was some, you know, holes uh on each of those guys russ was the you know the height at the time there weren't that many quarterbacks right. playing at that that height um and that's was there any concern about baseball no no concern about baseball okay uh, russ definitely wanted to play but uh kevin's the fancy was working with the quarterbacks at the time and and i remember he liked both of those guys but i think that the decision was as we were sitting there talking with personnel and coaches is that we have two young guys um, that we like, uh, and then Ponder was, you know, actually had that good year in 2012, but we went into it, but we thought we'd be too young at the quarterback position. I get it. Once again, the, the quarterback, the quarterbacks are hard to evaluate. I will say this based on the, uh, Netflix quarterback special from over the summer, uh, Kirk cousins and you have similar fashion choices. So you got that going for you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. 
That's so hilarious. I need to come up with a set of chains and shirtless on one of these podcasts. No, but I, he said his wife, I think, buys his clothes for him and a lot of like golf shirts, and he's just uh, you know, keeping it casual. You could wear the chains if you want to. That's probably what you wore when you were <laughs> the muscle at the combine. All right, let's talk about some of the uh, featured play players of this year's senior bowl that uh, are currently on the CBS Sports top fifty. As put together by, uh, this is just the rankings from me and Chris Paso and Josh Edwards that's on the website. Latu Latu is going to be there. We've talked about him a lot, the edge rusher out of um, UCLA. Byron Murphy, I just mentioned. Talisi Fuaga, the offensive lineman that I'm pretty excited to see. Uh, Kalen King. I There's an example, I think, of a guy who struggled in the Ohio State game and probably didn't play as well as he wanted to this season at times. And he could have a really good senior bowl and we'll have to reevaluate because that's what we do. Quinion yeah. Mitchell, we've been talking about for months, the kid at Toledo who has incredible ball skills. Uh, Michael Penix Jr. What do you think about this? The Michael Penix Jr. pushback, and I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast with some of the scouts I've spoken to, not being as widely loved as perhaps his productive season should dictate. Well, that's, yeah, I think that there'll be a lot of questions answered on him down at the Senior Bowl. So he will be one with a lot of eyes on him. Um, so I'm anxious to see him throw live. I'm anxious to see his arm and his release. Um, you He's know, eleven inch hands reportedly. Yeah. So it'll it'll be fun to watch him. And uh, you know, I was listening to Jim Nagy on on uh the Sirius XM NFL radio. He comes on and just talking about do you put him and Bo Nix on the same team so the scouts and the coaches that are down there can see them throwing a you know, back to back during the whole week of practice, or do you put them on opposite teams? So that's Jim Nagy does a phenomenal job in, in kind of going deeper into the weeds, trying to figure out how you put these guys on what teams you want to try to make it a competitive game, but there's a lot of good players on both sides. But in that example, is it more because the number one goal that Jim had stated is that we, we want to make sure that the NFL gets all the evaluation process done that they need to get done at the Senior Bowl. So is it more beneficial to have uh, Bo and Michael Penix on the same team so you can watch them work back-to-back uh, -back through all the week of practice or put them on opposite sides? I'll just mention quickly the quarterbacks that are on the roster um, that expect to be the Senior Bowl. Joe Milton out of Tennessee. We've talked about him. Spencer Rattler, my guy. Bo Nix. Michael Pratt out of Tulane. Sam Hartman out of Wake. Uh, Carter Bradley out of South Sam Alabama. Sam Hartman's out of Notre Dame. What'd I say? Wake. Ah, official. Uh, originally Wake over by way of Notre Dame. Thank you. Uh, Riley Leonard's my Notre Dame quarterback right now, Rick. So I've, I've moved on. Um, <laughs> and then Michael Penix Jr. we just talked about. Here's who, what I would do. I would put Joe Milton, Spencer Rattler, and Michael Penix Jr. on the same team and just have them throwing 1,000-mile-an-hour fastballs. <laughs> <laughs> I think the receivers probably wouldn't want that. But uh, that's an interesting conversation. So uh, something else to look out for. Cameron Kitchens, the safety out of Minnesota, uh, Miami. Excuse me, we talked about him. Uh, Ennis Rakestraw, the cornerback on Missouri. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Bo Nix, Patrick Paul, officer tackle out of Houston. Troy Fatani, uh, that's the guy who wears shorts that Ricks loves so much. Uh, the left tackle out of Washington. Graham Barton, I mentioned a moment ago, out of Duke. Tyler Guyton, uh, the offensive lineman out of Oklahoma. Michael Hall out of Ohio State. Chris Abrams Drain is uh, the teammate of Ennis Rakestraw, also a cornerback in Missouri. Troy Franklin out of um, Oregon. And then Josh Newton, the cornerback out of TCU. Then I mentioned the quarterbacks there. Coaches, by the way, and you mentioned they're doing this a little differently. Terrell Williams from the Titans will coach the American team. And Jeff Ulbrich of the Jets, who has a fantastic beard, <laughs> coach the national team. Both right. up and comers, I can tell you, that will be head coaches in a in a short period of time down well, the road. It's funny you say that because you mentioned Kevin Stefanski in 2012 was the quarterbacks coach. Is that what you said? Yeah, I think it was helping quarterbacks. Yeah, you, you just you never. I mean, it's just a matter of being smart, working hard, and these guys they they'll find you. I think is the the lesson I would imagine, right? Yeah, no, it's like Jonathan Gannon was a, a quality control for us in Minnesota. Uh, Drew Petzing, who's the offensive coordinator that he took with out of Arizona, was quarterbacks coach, receivers, assistant receivers coach. Uh, Nick Rollis, who is the uh, was a quality control guy that was linebackers when Gannon went to Philadelphia, is now the defensive coordinator out in Arizona. So it, it's amazing how small the circle is. 
But when you see these young guys, and you'll see, and I used to love watching the young coaches uh, and the energy and what they're teaching on the field. You're trying to get a feel for the personnel, but I always, in my position, try to look at these coaches and how well they coached on the field, and you get an opportunity to do that now yeah. uh, at East West because East West kind of started it when we would nominate uh, coaches to go coach in that game if they wanted to go, and now you're seeing it at the Senior Bowl. Yeah, no, it's fun to watch, and the more I do it, the the more interesting it becomes um, to watch from afar. By the way, I got a little present for you when we get to the Senior Bowl, Rick. I won't unveil it until we get there, see if you are impressed or not. So that'll be a little tease for next week. All right, let's take a quick break. Are you binoculars? Tell me you're bringing binoculars so you don't have to use mine. That was going to be the secret, but you ruined it. Way to go, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll have binoculars next week so I can see Rick from across the stadium when he gets on my nerves. I got to take a, take a walk. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk with the players that can help their stock the most next week at the Senior Bowl right after this. The biggest event in sports is coming to the entertainment capital of the world. CBS Sports HQ will have you covered every minute, getting you set with all the critical analysis you need. Ready, set, Vegas. All right, Rick. Isn't my memory amazing how I got on you the whole time we were there last year about not having binoculars? I ordered them over the summer, and I was attend, intended to use them to some of the Syracuse games I went to, ended up not going to any Syracuse games this year because there weren't uh, there weren't very good matchups in terms of players I wanted to see from the other team. So I had them already packed and ready to go, and uh, I look forward to you giving me a hard time about something else now. <laughs> I don't have a stopwatch, so you can you can go on that rant if you'd like. All right, let's start with your list, Rick. I'll uh, mention the names, and then we can we can go through them at how you see best. Byron Murphy. Uh, the second, the, the defense tackle out of Texas. We talked a lot about him. I asked you a month or so ago if he's a first-round pick. You said, I don't see why not, and there's a lot of buzz about him being a first-round pick. Um, I think we agreed that he's better than Kalijah Kansi coming out. Yes, because I think he's stronger at the point versus the run, plays with tremendous leverage. I'm excited to see him against some of these offensive linemen because I think it's a really good group yeah. of offensive line in the one-on-one -on -one pass rush drills. But I think this kid has a combination – even though he's a little undersized, plays stronger than his size, but such an explosive athlete, and such an explosive inside pass rusher. And if he has a good week down there, uh, which I anticipate he will, uh, that I don't see why he doesn't slide into the first round somewhere in the bottom of the first round. Too hard to find defensive guys like this. And to me, as the season unfolded, it's not an extremely strong defensive tackle class. I mean, you got Newton at Illinois, and I'm not surprised if he has a strong senior bowl week that this kid doesn't end up as the second defensive tackle off the board. And by the way, Kalaja Kansi had a great rookie season too, just for as, a, as an idea of what that might look like next year for Byron. Um, the other thing about uh, the Texas defensive tackles, I like him over Tavondre Sweat, even though Tavondre, because Tavondre Sweat might be a two down player for all we know, even though he's 330 or 340. I thought he was more effective, Byron Young, than his teammate. Yeah, I, Sweat's a, a really good athlete for his size. Can't move him off the spot, but teams are also going to look for inline pass rushers, which are hard to find. And what a difference that they can make in a game if you can get some guys that can rush from the inside. And I think this kid's really going to uh, help himself uh, going forward through this pre-draft process based on how he played this season. Yeah, I, I'm excited to, to watch him play. All right, Quinion Mitchell, the cornerback out of Toledo. We've talked about him a good bit. In fact, we had a five-star Apple review to talk about Quinion after we talked about him, so we'll talk about him again here. And by the way, just as a preview, if you want us to talk about one of your favorite players who's draft eligible, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and we will talk about any FBS or FCS player that's on your mind. Just let us know. Uh, Quinion, the last time we talked about him, nothing's changed because <laughs> the season's over. Long. Ball skills, pass breakup skills. You've described his footwork as raw. So what do you want to see this week or next week in Mobile? I just want to see him move around physically um, because you can see it on tape. Uh, but he is the prototype size, speed athlete that you look for at the position. Uh, the unique ball skills, I think when we talked about the first game I watched him was against Illinois this year. He had three tackles and a PBU. Then he had like five PBUs against San Jose State. And I was like, wow, this guy 
uh, is jumping off the tape a little bit and played solid all the way through the Mac schedule. And so I think this guy has an opportunity because now you had both Alabama corners come out. Um, you have, you know, King that we talked about, but I think this guy, you know, Lassiter, was it Lassiter? Uh, Ari Lassiter out of Georgia. Georgia. So there's a bunch of corners. I don't think there's a clear cut number one corner in this class, unless you think something differently. Our guy, uh, Nate Wiggins as well. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, I mean, you've been in love with him since last summer. Yeah. So, um, but this kid has an opportunity to go down to the senior bowl, face some pretty good receivers. And uh, let's see if he doesn't not come into the conversation as one of the top corners, which I think he is right now coming yep. out this year's draft. I don't want to call it a cautionary tale, but just something to keep in mind how we fall in love with these guys. Last year, Darius Rush out of South Carolina had a fantastic senior bowl as a cornerback. Like out, off the charts, great in the one on one drills. Didn't um I think it was a fifth round pick, maybe? Yeah, he he uh because his tape didn't equate to what we saw down right. at the senior bowl. So there's an example of a kid who had a fantastic senior bowl. Everybody was talking about him, and then I believe. He went to the combine and uh, ran in the four threes uh, at the combine. He got drafted, uh, was it by Indy in the fifth round, got cut, was claimed by Kansas City, uh, was cut, then put on their practice squad, and then Pittsburgh stole him off Kansas City's practice squad and put him on the 53. So his story's not yet told, but there was a guy that really stuck out down at the Senior Bowl but teams relied on what they saw on tape. That's why he went on the fifth round because you were saying this guy at least has to go on Friday the way he played uh, during the senior bowl practice week. Um, so that's why it's so important that you get what you need to get the senior bowl, but you always have to remember what you've seen and how you evaluate him through his career on tape. Yeah. So that's uh, just something to keep in mind as you go through the process because, oh my gosh, I, you think I love uh, Spencer Rattler and Nate Wiggins? I was I was Darius Rush's biggest fan after that week because it was a, it was a fun week to watch. I'd never seen anything like that in those one on one drills. Um, no. But again, no, when you were slobbering all over me, and I was like, just act like you've been here at the Senior Bowl and bring some binoculars the next time you come. That was the problem. I used binoculars to watch Darius Rush. I was like, oh my gosh, this kid's good. My binoculars, your binoculars. That's right. Your name is actually written on them. All right, Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint, the wide receiver out of Georgia. Uh, much of the conversations about Brock Bowers and even Lad McConkey. Um, but what'd you think about this guy? Yeah, this guy was a little bit of a pleasant surprise. Um, as I was going through the Georgia tape and I did Lad, and then I was like, who's this other kid? And so you may think I'm crazy. Oh boy. Did you watch this kid yet? I haven't watched him yet. He's on I got I'll, I'll watch him this weekend. I think it's the schedule. Yeah, he's long, he's athletic, he has that flexibility in his upper body to make a lot of unique catches. Um, catches in his hands. He's a little bit of a weaver after the catch, but he does have speed. Uh, I think he's going to run faster, but if I had to make a comparison, uh, he reminded me a little of Wicks last year. Oh, that's I, not a bad comp. No, when I, uh, when I watched him on tape. So he was a pleasant surprise if I was trying to hammer out as much of these senior boys. I didn't get through them all, but this kid kind of was like, yeah, I want to make sure I uh, get my eyes on him down at the Senior Bowl. So I think Don Tavian Wicks ended up running in the four fives, not fast. Does he play? And Don Tavian actually plays faster than that. Does I would imagine you think he plays faster than four five five or whatever? Yeah, this kid's a little bit of a long strider like Wicks, uh, but I think he builds up speed. Um, they run him on a lot of deep crossing routes, and you see him create separation the longer the route is. And I really liked uh, his hands in a way he's able to adjust to the ball. All right. Next up, Jackson Powers Johnson. Watched him last night. I like this guy. Hey. He's a little spark plug. He has a little edge to him. Yeah, this kid's only uh, 20 years old. So Center out of Oregon, by the way. Let me make that clear yeah. for people listening. And uh, this was another guy that I've heard. I didn't watch him till uh, this week. And I was impressed with his athleticism. I was impressed with his power at the point. Uh, I was impressed with his grit and the way he tries to finish, especially in the run game. I think technically he's got a ways to go yet, but 
he was more athletic to me than we watched uh, Tipman last year from Wisconsin, than we watched uh, John Michael Schmitz uh, from Minnesota. I thought this guy had a little more athleticism, but he played with that kind of grit. Yeah, um, I'm looking at his stats here that I wrote down so I wouldn't forget. Zero sacks allowed uh, last season. Zero sacks allowed and in, in actually over 1,300 snaps over the last three years. So, Well, take, take into consideration the offense, too. That's true. But, I mean, you know, he ain't getting blown up. No. Um, let me see here. He feels like an early day two guy to me. I know that some of the media mock drafts have him going in the first round. He felt like a, a day two guy. I think he's a fr- I think he's a Friday guy. I think he's a second round guy right now. So I, I just don't see any, you know, we'll get into it more as we go through the prodca- podcast. But I don't think, you know, he's going to pass up a Barton or someone like that who I really liked. Uh, as a football player. Yeah, I watched Graham again the other day. I, I, I came around on him. The game I over the summer I didn't love him. I rewatched him. Um and I, I was like, okay, this guy, this guy's got it. <laughs> Pretty good football player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He he's uh a little bit of the Zion Johnson arc that I talked about. Like uh, the arm issue, is that the length why I can't the, the issue why I can't play left tackle? Yeah, that'll be the concern. So it's just right. like when Mock went to the Senior Bowl last year yeah. and put him in guard right away because of his arm length, even though he was a left tackle at North Dakota State. And Peter Stronsky had a great start to his season when he was healthy for the Titans, moving from left tackle at Northwestern to, to left guard for, for Tennessee. So there's precedent there. All right, one more guy for you out of Houston Christian, edge rusher, Jalex Hunt. And um, let's see, I didn't love him. And that can change. But based on what I watched, I, I wanted to see a little more. So why'd you put him on this list? <laughs> because I had to put five on the list and five guys that I was intrigued to see at the Senior Bowl. And this okay. kid was intriguing to me. Uh, you did six. I did five. I follow the rules. You don't. Uh, <laughs> but um, this kid is long. He's athletic. He can run. He's playing against, you know, nothing – to discredit your athleticism, but you could probably have a better chance of blocking him than some of the guys that were trying to block him. Uh, Tomato cans, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> I'm just saying this is a kid that everybody will be excited to see because you see the length. I think you see the athleticism. You see the speed. You see that he is as raw as they come with learning how to use his hands, how to play, all that stuff. He's got a ways to go. But is this one of those guys from a small school that shows up athletically, just like the guy, the uh, safety you fell in love with last year at the Senior Bowl from Sac State? Marty Mapu. Yeah. Um, but guys like this, it's the biggest stage for him because yeah. uh, coming from Texas Christian, I don't think he's played against the Alabamas or or any of the other teams. Houston I mean, Christian, not even Texas Christian. Oh, well, Houston Christian. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. sorry. Uh, but so I'm anxious just to see this raw athlete and how far he is away from actually making an NFL roster. If he's too big a project, that's why I put him on this list. No. And the, the point is a, an important one because you should never dismiss anyone based on a couple games or it's a whole process. And I, in the past, I've been like, okay, well, I've watched this player or this player had a t- like Gardner Minshew did not have a great senior bowl. That's not the end all be all. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that could go into it. So you can't just rely on that. And it's funny, I watched all of uh Jalex Hunt's sacks and, and they basically played out as you described them. He's beaten guys who probably won't be playing football after their college careers are over. There was a couple of uh he was left unblocked for some reason. He's just destroying the quarterback. So that's not his problem. I mean, he's doing what no, he's being asked and he to plays, do. He plays hard. And yeah, he's, he a, does. he's an aggressive kid. And yeah. it's like, you know, he's playing against guys who go into their coach and say, coach, what do I need to work on? And the coach said, your degree. because. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, Hunt transferred from uh, Cornell. So um, nothing else. He's a smart dude. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, and I think you sort of hinted at it, Debo wanted us to mention, Jalex Hunt is probably going to be like a late day three undrafted free agent territory, unless he splashes, but he has an opportunity to make a roster. Right. But these are the guys you want to see now. Now you can get a true measure of how far he is away. Yeah. Going that's up against the senior. That's what, you know, I was glad that guys like this get invited to the senior bowl. They not may not be as ahead or farther along. There's other guys farther along 
that maybe are not here, but this kid has, out of any of the kids we've talked about, you know, there's guys jockeying for where they're going to get potentially drafted. This kid either is going to put himself on the radar or not. It's, this is the type of kid that if he shows up down at the senior bowl, uh-oh, we better go back and do some more work on him. Another example, played another position last year, Tyson Bajan. Like, we were like, okay, this guy is overwhelmed. He obviously out of his element, Division II Shepherd, And it took him a while to get his act together. He started a few football games. He did a really good job for the Bears based on where he came and how far he came to get there. Yep. So never say never. Don't sleep on these kids. All right. When we come back, we'll get to the list that includes a, a bonus for you people because I, I like the listeners and the viewers, and I want to give them something special despite Rick's – disagreement with that all right after the break we'll take a look at my list right after this wake up to football highlights and news from around the world with the one and only morning footy team rise and shine football fans welcome to morning footy start your all-day football craze with morning footy part of the all-new galazzo network all right rick let's start at the top bo nix this quarterback no disrespect to last year's quarterback Senior Bowl class, this class is stacked. This is going to be yep. fun to watch. And I talked about Tyson Bajan, another name that I'll mention that has a chance to help himself in a, in a different regard. But certainly given the pre-draft or the pre-fall buzz prior to the 2023 college season, Joe Milton. So we'll see what happens for him because he probably could make uh, a bigger move than anyone if he comes up there and balls out. But I want to talk about Bo Nix right now, who's been in college for eight or nine years, I believe. <laughs> Transfer from Auburn, had two good years at Oregon. He does a lot of things really well. He does so many things above average that I think we sleep on him and underrate him. But I feel like I've said this since this, the, the fall, and I don't know if you're as rich on him as I am, but I feel like he's a second-round pick all day long. You can bring him in. He can play spot duty right away, and maybe a year from now he's your starter. I don't know, but I, I a lot of things I like about Bo Nix. Yeah, I'm anxious to see him throw live. Um uh, there's no question about his athleticism. The biggest thing, I don't know if you'll get um, a true feel for it because of the limitations of schematic, just his decision-making. Yeah. Because uh, that's the biggest question I have on him. And they may get a lot of that in the interview process while they're down there. And that'll be addressed as he goes through the combine and uh, top 30s or whatever, and teams do film study and ask him what he's seeing and why he made this decision. So I think all the physical, there's nothing physically wrong with him that I have any issues with. I think my biggest concern is the decision making. And he played in the bowl game. And he played in the bowl game, which moved him up around for me. <laughs> he beat the pants off of Liberty for no good reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, I'm, I want to see how this process goes for him because I think maybe we're not talking enough about him because we spent a lot of time talking about the other quarterbacks and I get that, but he is sort of quietly had two really good solid seasons at, at Oregon. And there has been some first round media buzz. We'll see how teams feel about him uh, as we get through the process here. All right, next up, I mentioned him and you mentioned him a moment ago, talking about his teammate at Georgia, Lad McConkey. He might be one of my favorite players in this draft class. Uh, he runs routes with urgency. He gets up the line of scrimmage like he has somewhere to be. And a lot of times when you watch uh, wide receivers, they they don't run the routes with the urgency you want, and sometimes can mess up the timing of, of what the offense is trying to do. That said, he also understands changing speeds to to create separation and setting up the the defensive back. He has great hands. He has a big catch radius. Again, I would draft him in the second round all day long in a crowded group of of wide receivers that can go in the second round and feel great about it. Yeah, if he runs what I think he's going to run because he has acceleration after the catch, there's a couple of games that I watched on him that he pulls away from uh, the defenders that are trying to close on him. He can outrun angles. Uh, I think he he is fast, but he plays fast too. There are guys that, pl that time fast that don't play fast. This kid, I think, is going to run fast. and play. I think he's a potentially a top 50 pick or even higher. All right, um, not knowing what you're going to say, let's make a first dollar bet here. I'm going to set the over under on the 40 time for Lad McConkey at four four five. I'll take under. All right, Debo, mark it down. And the first thing that came to mind, I'm not trying to be a jerk when you said time fast doesn't play quite that fast. Alec Pierce, like Alec Pierce, ran in the four threes. I think I want him to explode, and he he showed glimpses towards the end of the season. But that's a guy that um that I was just, just disappointed. All right. He's a little stiff. Ennis Rakestraw Jr. 
And Debo asked me about him the other day. And I was like, yeah, I have him as a top 50 guy. But there's some first-round buzz about this young man, too, in the media. We'll find out together. Uh, I think he's uh, like a mid to late second-round pick right now. But who knows what that means? Uh, he's undersized. But like Devin Witherspoon, he plays like he weighs 30 pounds heavier. Like he's looking to run through guys. He, he's really good uh, in coverage. My concern with him, and I want to see how this looks out over the course of the next 91 days, is deep speed. Because that it could be a situation where that affects his draft stock. But again, you have to remind yourself, does he play faster than he times, Brian Branch? Or is it a situation where it's to reverse that? But I think he, uh, at times, seemed like he was a little nervous about getting getting beaten deep, but I mean, there's a lot to like target 31 times, zero interceptions, had two PBUs, uh, but he's a physical presence. And now I, I liked a lot about his game. Yeah. Uh, I did this kid this morning. Uh, Cause I did his partner yesterday, Abrams drain. Yeah. Uh, another good football. They had two good corners at yep. Missouri. Um, but this kid was a pleasant surprise for me. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, the one thing I know is that he is an aggressive, will come up, even though he may be slight of frame, he's not afraid to come up and whack you. And he plays with a sense of urgency. He is one of the most, just watching his mannerisms after a play, he is it, all ball. And <laughs> it's any corner that I watched this year, this kid was the most competitive, uh, just and I'm, I'm reading the tea leaves on his mannerisms and how hard that he plays. Um, I think that he, you know, he, he has some technical issues that he needs to work on. I think that he needs to be a little bit more patient, uh, especially when they press him in man coverage and some of the things, I think he just gets so wound up that just relax, dude, just mirror the guy coming out. You want to like put your hands on him. You want to beat the hell out of him. Uh, just relax and and let it come to you sometimes. But <laughs> he is a, a tone setter on defense, uh, which is hard to find on uh, at this position. You know, we talked about Weatherspoon and those kids in Illinois being tone setters, where they're physical, even though they may be a little undersized. I don't think he's as smooth as Weatherspoon is when he came out last year. But this kid, I think, is a Friday pick. Um, but this kid was fun to watch because he would have fit just in my just good football player category because I w love watching him play so much. I'm laughing because the Kansas State game, uh, he was trying to fight through a, a oh yeah a pick at the, on the red zone slant, and he was yelling and screaming at his teammates for not helping out. And that, I was thinking about that when you mentioned that, it was uh, yelling at the official, and then they threw the flag that it was a pick, and then uh, <laughs> but he's it. he's competitive as hell, and that's that what was, you want. That's yeah. what you want, especially that position. Like you said, there's not a lot of that at the cornerback position, or at least that to that level. Uh, even Devin Witherspoon's like, yeah, take a deep breath. In a <laughs> You're going to kill yourself doing that. All right, next up, Dwayne Carter out of Duke, defensive lineman. Uh, another twitched-up young man who plays with some power, plays with good leverage, finds himself in the backfield quite often, can stand up the double teams. I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, the Notre Dame game, he had a few snaps against Joe Alt when he's playing outside. Now, Alt can certainly hold his own, but Dwayne gave a run for his money. It was fun to watch that matchup. The few times it it, it, it happened, um, had a uh, fumble recovery against UConn, ran it back to the house, twenty six yards. So he's a little, he's a pretty good athlete in space. Um, oh, I even got a comp for this one. Let me back up. Let me give my comp for Lad McConkey. Hold on to your squeeze ball here. I was actually, I really like this comp for Lad McConkey, Emmanuel Sanders. Okay. You made worse faces. <laughs> <laughs> you had to think about it. All right. So stew on that for a little bit. So Dwayne Carter, again, he I feels like better, his route running to me was like when Riggs came out of Alabama, but bet he has better hands than Riggs. Then who? Who is a receiver? Uh, are you we back on are we talking about McCon who are we talking about? Are we talking about Yeah, I was talking about Lad. Uh, just the con the, the Manny Sanders cup. Devo Henry Ruggs, you're talking about. Oh, Henry Ruggs, gotcha. Okay. Ruggs. Yeah. The yeah. route running reminded me of Henry Ruggs, but the hands are much better. Yeah. Okay. All right. And now Devo just flashed a picture of Dwayne Carter. So we're we're back on Dwayne Carter, the interior defense lineman at Duke. I just remembered that I had that comp for Lad. I'm gonna throw that out at you. Because my comp for I'll tell you my comp for Dwayne Carter after you tell me about him. I don't want to get you off 
off your game. Were, I think he was one of the five star reviews, or I remember talking about him during the season. Um, so we did him uh, during the fall. Uh, this guy is not a defensive end to me. He's one of the, he. Um, I think he's going to have to slide inside. Yeah, I, I think, think so. yeah that he's twitchy. Uh, he plays hard. I did watch. We watched the Notre Dame game. I thought he flashed there. I think this is one of those guys that they need to move inside uh, down at the Senior Bowl, and let's see how he performs in tighter quarters uh, where he has work through bumpers of between the center and guard, guard uh, tackle. Uh, but I like this kid's motor. I like this kid's energy that he plays with. Uh, I think he can be disruptive. I think he was more disruptive than productive, but he was another good football player. Day two for me. Let's see. Oh, oh. oh. Yeah, I, I'm going to go day. I'm going to go third. I'm going to go fourth instead of third right now. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think he. I. I. He was fun. The other thing I was thinking about is we sort. If I get years into this draft stuff and looking back at guys like Justin Matabike coming out of Texas A&M, I was like, my goodness, this kid is twitched up. It took him two or three years to figure it out. Now he's about to get paid a lot of money. And sometimes you just got to be patient and see what happens. So I'll give you my comp real quick for Dwayne Carter, and then you can throw your squeeze ball against the wall. Larry Okunjobi. <laughs> oh, you hated that one, Devo. <laughs> yeah, that's great, Ryan. You're you're. How long we've we been doing this? How many episodes? One fifteen. Okay. Well, you're getting better. I was going to say, I feel like I'm getting better, right? Out. Yeah, you are getting better. Last year at this time, it was horrible. At least you're getting in the ballpark range. Yeah, I have a few ups on the chart, and then the downs, and a few ups. Yeah. All right. Last last year they were all downs. Yeah, last year I thought you were gonna gonna quit. Oh, I would never quit. It's too fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were else you gonna get comps like this. <laughs> All right. Next up, this is a guy you talked about uh Jalex Hunt. This is my Jalex Hunt. James Williams, the safety slash linebacker. He's listed as a linebacker on the roster. The senior bowl played all over the place, a lot of deep safety too, a lot of slot for Miami. Um I didn't check I, as per the Rick Spielman scouting rules. I didn't check his height or weight. But at, until after I watch him, he's listed at six five. <laughs> he is a tall drink of water, and he will slap the doo doo out of you. Like when he comes downhill, he's looking to hit something. He actually plays, I thought, pretty under control coming downhill in terms of wrapping up and tackling. Showed a little sideline to sideline ability in terms of running guys down. Maybe he's a, a Kyle Duggar type. Maybe he's a Marty Mapu type in terms of where you put him as a chess piece, uh, Hufanga type out of San, uh, San Francisco uh, by way of USC. But yeah. I was pleasantly surprised with this guy. Yeah, and I haven't done – I've just done one game on him, so I can't – I'm not going to sit here and, and BS my way through this evaluation. Um, but the way that you described him, it sounded a little bit like uh, – a little like how Dallas uses uh, uh, curse. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I'm curious to see why – We drafted curse, and I mean, we drafted him late. He went didn't go to the seventh round, but he was a 6'4", um, played – slot played safety played you know all over the place and i i can't make that comparison i'm just listening to you so to help you on a comparison if i'm the sitting in front of the room and you were happen to sitting in my seat in the corner yeah i would say oh that kind of reminded me a little of how we saw a uh, curse when he i just made up. that note so i'm going to steal that so when you yell at me about that comp i can remind you and diva can remind you the comp came from you well let me do the kid and i'm going to tell you you're totally off I just... <laughs> that's true too that's true but I, I want to see why he's listed as a linebacker is it is he stiffer than i saw in space like what what's the reason but we'll find out and i'm he was fun though he, he was a fun player it feels like the way the nfl is going in terms of guys playing sort of amorphous positions he feels like he fits that perfectly all right and finally Javon Foster out of Missouri. Offensive tackle. Left tackle only the last three seasons. Uh, 850 plus snaps each season at the position. One sack allowed. Um, 12 hurries in 2023 and 13 games. This dude is enormous. Like long arm, long legged. But when I checked the weight, he's 6'5, 319. Like he's he looked like he weighed 340. He's got a big butt. I thought he's like 335, 340, moved really well. I like the way um, he was able to mirror and pass protection. He was moving people off the ball in the run game. Was more athletic than I thought. Pretty good against speed rushers. I was impressed. I hadn't watched Javon. I'd seen his name, but I hadn't watched him all year. 
another Missouri player. I don't know if you had an opportunity to watch him yet. I did. What'd you think? Because I, I know there are mixed reviews. Uh, I'm on the other side. Of you. Yeah, why? Well, I want to know why, because I didn't see it. Because he lined up at left tackle. I thought he had athletic limitations at left tackle, especially in pass pro when he got out of position. You can't rush okay. him down the middle because he'll anchor. Uh, I love his aggressive style of play, but I think he gets out of control. I think he can move people at the point in the run game. In pass pro, he has to win early. If he doesn't get his hands locked on there early, that's where he has struggles. I didn't see a left tackle athlete. I saw more of a right tackle or potential inside at guard. Interesting. Because okay. of, of his demeanor and the grit and toughness that he plays with. But I just didn't see the pass pro athlete at left tackle. If he And when I mean win early in the down, he has to get his hands on him. If not, he gets his hands on him, they're done. But if he has to take a deep set and he has to mirror or try to adjust with his feet, he lunges and he just doesn't have the athletic skill set to regain position, in my opinion. You know, it's funny that you say that. As I watched them, and they are completely different sizes, but I got the sense of our buddy Dewan Jones being able just to engulf people. Um, obviously, when you're 340 or 380 or whatever he is, that's a different story because you're locking on the guys that you outweigh by 100 pounds. But I got that sense in terms of the locking on part of it. Um, so you don't think he's as good an athlete as Dewan Jones? I didn't think Dewan Jones was a good athlete. He's just hard to get around because he's so <laughs> massive. Yeah, well, I thought that that made him a good athlete just because he could move as well as he did at that size. Interesting. All right, so where – is this a day three guy for you? I, I'm going to hold judgment, okay. um, but he's borderline for me, day two, day three. Yeah, I was uh, excited when I watched him, and then I saw some of the other media takes. I was like, oh, okay, well, let's see what old Rick says about it because um, – all right, we'll do more homework and see how the senior bowl goes for him. But that's why we're having these conversations. All right, so we got one one dollar bet in there. I'll ask you quickly before we leave of the quarterbacks: Joe Milton, Spencer Rattler, Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., Michael Pratt, Sam Hartman, and Carter Bradley. Which I haven't I haven't seen him yet, but I will before we get to our South Alabama. Which quarterback has the best week? Penix. You think so? Yes. Unfortunately for Michael Penix, there won't be bad weather there. It's supposed to be pretty sunny. So he won't have an opportunity to show that he can spin it in the bad weather a few years ago. Uh, yeah, don't don't worry about all the rain games he played out in Seattle. There's no rain ever out there. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus, what are we? What what am I doing with my life right now? <laughs> don't worry about the Oregon State game. That didn't matter. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. They, they didn't play great in it for what it's worth. But okay. um, it's all uh, rainbows and butterflies out there from a weather standpoint in Seattle. Yeah. Plus, you know, you can learn more at a senior bowl practice with wet football than so you can an actual football game. Okay. All right. That is a wrap. Next week we'll be live from the Senior Bowl. Three game, uh, three days, possibly even four days. We'll see. I don't know if I told you the latest, Debo, but Rick's thinking about hanging around Monday, uh, it's Friday morning. We might do a podcast before he heads back to, to Florida. So that's on the to-do list. But uh, we'll be mobile all week. In the meantime, thanks for watching and listening and leaving us comments and leave the five-star review of a player you want us to review, and we'll do it. For Rick, for Debo, I'm Ryan Wilson. Thank you, guys. We'll see you guys next week from Mobile.